Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you for the privilege. I'm going to start first with a simple question. Is, is NATO ready for potential escalation with Russia? Seems like we are lacking in air defense capabilities and we also in Latvia had an instance where a Russian drone flew in to our territory and the armed forces did not have the capability to detect it and they essentially found out about it after the fact. So can we say that we are prepared and is Russia testing our red lines? So first of course, Russia is at war with us already. We, we may not acknowledge it or we don't want to act like it, the collective we, but what they do with uh, drones testing, um, although I don't know that it's proven yet whether or not the one that landed in Latvia was an accident or was intentional, but there have been so many violations uh, and it does show that Russia is irresponsible or careless because they, they allow different weapons to get so close to the border where the chances of an accident happen. Um, what they do, uh, sabotage, um, disinformation, uh, constant violations of international law, su such as with the ghost fleet carrying oil out, total disregard for international law. So I think Russia is at war with us. Um, we, should, we should have the same mindset. Um, they'll stop flying drones or missiles even close to our borders after, they, after we shoot them down. Um, I think we should be doing that. Now, um, of course, the Alliance does not have a, we've never had a perfect shield that, that gets everything. So I, I would not read too much into the fact that you know, a, a drone got in and was not detected. If there were 20 or 30 that came in, that, that would obviously be a, a gigantic problem. That would show a real problem in our defenses. Um, I absolutely believe we do not have enough air and missile defense to protect all of NATO's critical infrastructure. If, if Russia has made the terrible decision to attack a NATO country, they've also already made the terrible decision to destroy our transportation infrastructure. So this is an area where I would prioritize for NATO, making sure that all of our critical infrastructure is protected. President Zelensky's victory plan, do you feel like it's viable and will it work? It is viable. It is achievable, it is feasible, uh, and it's doable if we do our part. Um, I was impressed because he, uh, it was a comprehensive plan. It's not just military, it's economic, it's diplomatic. Uh, and he talks about uh, eventual alliance membership and the importance of offering the formal invitation now, which does not equal immediate membership. And, and uh, I think that's a very wise way to frame it. Um, but it, it does require us in the West, especially the United States and especially Germany, to commit to helping Ukraine actually win this war. Um, we haven't done that yet. And I think it's a mistake. It's a shortcoming on our part. It's a failure on our part to not commit to actually helping Ukraine win this war, to knock Russia all the way back to the 1991 border. And yes, of course, that includes Crimea. So um, if we did that, then his plan is absolutely achievable. Uh, it makes great sense. I just, I uh, am frustrated that we have not stepped up to that yet. I think because we have an excessive fear of Russian escalation. Building on this, do you feel like the Western world truly does want Ukraine to win? And isn't there some hypocrisy there um, with not allowing um, to use rockets deeper inside of Russia to attack military targets? Because the red lines that were there in the beginning of the war have now moved. First of all, this, this is a terrible policy of the United States that also affects UK from providing uh, storm shadow, uh, and it allows Germany to hide its refusal to provide Taurus because of this uh, US policy, which I think is misguided. It's 
it's a, a terrible policy. There's no moral, uh, legal, or operational reason not to let Ukraine use uh, the weapons that we've provided against targets inside Russia. This goes back to what I just said earlier. Because we have not committed to helping Ukraine win, uh, we have not clearly identified that as a strategic objective. We come up with, with bad policies because they're not, they're not connected to uh, a clear end state. So I'm not, uh, I don't think that the West as a whole is committed to helping Ukraine win. Certainly countries from Finland all the way down to uh, Romania, they're not confused. They know uh, what it's like to be under Russian control or Russian uh, living next to Russia. So all of these countries clearly want to see Ukraine actually win this war. Poland, including Poland, when you start going further west, people start getting a little bit more squishy about it. And for sure, the United States and Canada have not, um, have not made that the strategic priority, which is, I think is a huge mistake. And speaking about the situation on the front line in Ukraine, anything you would want to highlight? Um, is Russia mounting pressure on certain parts of the front line? And can we expect any breaking point, either militarily or morale-wise? I would say it's useful to put what's happening uh, around Pokrovsk and in the Donbass region in proper uh, context of where we are in the war and where they are on the map. This war has been going on for ten and a half years, ten and a half years, over a decade. Russia started this with every advantage. The Allies, the, especially U.S. and Germany, have never even committed to helping Ukraine win. We are providing equipment that is 30, 40 years old. Um, and still, despite all that, Russia only controls about one quarter of Ukraine. They've lost over 600,000 killed and wounded. The Black Sea Fleet is not even a factor. Their Navy is not a factor anymore. Uh, the Russian Air Force, with huge advantages, has failed its two principal tasks. It has failed to achieve air superiority, and it has failed to interdict the lines of communication bringing stuff from Poland into Ukraine. It's a failure, huge failure by the Air Force and Navy. Um, half of Russia's ammunition comes from North Korea, Russia. Um, and now we're starting to see perhaps the beginning, I don't know, of North Korean soldiers because the Kremlin is so scared of their own people that they don't want to have to mobilize young men from Moscow and St. Petersburg and have funerals going through those streets uh, like happens out in all the other outlying areas of the Russian Federation. So I would say when you hear, oh my God, Vuladar has fallen, where is it at on the map? It is in the, like the eastern 5% of Ukraine. And you know, newspapers call it the strategic, what a ridiculous description. It's not strategic. Um, the Ukrainians would be the ones to decide if it's strategic. These are not strategic. These are bombed out ruins from cities where they used to be uh, important communities. Now, of course it sucks if you're the commander there or if you're a soldier there with glad bombs landing on your bunker. Of course it's terrible. But from the standpoint of the war, I would say that the Ukrainian general staff recognizes that the Russians cannot just overrun them. They don't have the ability to penetrate and to keep going to the Dnipro, for example. Um, and that the, and, and I think the Russians actually know this also, that they know they cannot knock Ukraine out of the war and that their only chance, their only hope is if we quit. Seeing that the U.S. is providing significant aid to some of its other allies, like Israel, and it's maybe some of the things that Ukraine would also like to be getting. Is there maybe a sense of frustration in Kyiv? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're frustrated in Kyiv. Um, almost everybody that I know that cares about Ukraine is frustrated. I mean, of course we want to see Israel protected against Iranian attacks, but why? What, what is the difference from a policy standpoint where we have American airmen flying in Israeli airspace, you have the U.S. Navy shooting missiles against Houthi rockets to protect commercial shipping in the Red Sea uh, and in Gulf of Aden, 
why, why aren't we doing that in Europe? I'm not talking about attacking Russian airplanes, although I would be okay with that, uh, but to at least shoot down missiles that are flying into uh, apartment buildings. And this goes back to, uh, again, I think the administration has an excessive fear that Russia might follow through on its threats to use nuclear weapons. I think there's almost zero chance Russia uses a nuclear weapon because there's no benefit for Russia to use a nuclear weapon. The only benefit they get is the threat that they might do it, and they see how we self-deter because of that. So I think um, if, if we could get past that, then I think you would see uh, NATO air forces. Well, first of all, if you get past that, all of these things, we'd be in a different situation completely. Thank you for taking the time to answer my questions. Thank you for the privilege, Paul.